Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Scooby-Doo Review. I'm your host, Zerk. With me is my co-host, Penn. Say hello, Penn. Hello, everybody. Woo. This week and every other Wednesday, until we either run out of things to review or expire, we will once again be reviewing a piece of Scooby-Doo media. This week, we are continuing our binge on the 1977 Scooby-Doo show now, as we begin our talks about season two of the Scooby-Doo show. This is going to be an interesting season, as I find that it uh, follows an inverse bell curve in terms of quality, uh, in that we start off and finish strong, but there's kind of a lull in the middle. You'll see why when we get there. But without any further ado, let's begin our suffering today by summarizing the story. Pat, would you like to start us off? So, first of all, for this episode, we are going to be reviewing The Curse of Viking Lake, Vampire Bats and Scaredy Cats, and Hang in There, Scooby-Doo. So, those being Season 2, Episodes three, uh, 1 to 3. Uh, so, we're going to start off with The Curse of Viking Lake, which takes place in an indeterminate location somewhere on a coast. I wrote down Minnesota Vikings on the notes because I thought it was the most fucking hilarious thing in the moment. Yes. Uh, But uh, we're unclear as to where this actually takes place. It could occur anywhere from Newfoundland to Oregon. Yep. We don't know. As long as there's Vikings and a lake that they could conceivably have a Viking longboat be on. Yes. Which weird villain plot. I would investigate the damn longboat. I feel like that would be way more su- suspect than like a suspect liner carrying uranium across the lake. But I mean, we're getting I mean, ahead of ourselves there. If you're the Coast Guard. Like, what are you gonna? What are you gonna do? Shoot at them? They're a Viking longboat, Zach. You don't see those. You're scared. You're afraid. It's gonna. It's gonna explode into ghosts, and they're gonna spook you. So the gang uh, is going trout fishing. Uh, up at Velma's Uncle John's property somewhere in nondescript coastal cold place. Yeah. Um, And prior to the gang's arrival, we see Velma's Uncle John get beset by a ghost Viking doing a very, very terrible Nordic accent provided by Frank Welker. Uh, Frank Welker, I love you, buddy, but... You, you got to get an accent coach for that one, man. Your it's, Scottish is really good later on in what's new, but your Nordic, eh, not great in this one. <laughs> well, I mean, he does his best, but it's not, it's not all there. Yeah, <laughs> truly. So the Viking, I guess, kidnaps Uncle John and we then have the gang arrive. Yep. Uh, in the van, Scooby and Shaggy are... Oh, my. I must clear my throat. Oh. In the van, Scooby and Shaggy are just talking about um, getting hot chocolate. When they open the hot chocolate, is it revealed to be just a sludge? Flush? A solid hot chocolate that... Scoob takes a stick out of and then just starts licking at it like a popsicle. I don't think that would be very good. Just a frozen, a frozen hot chocolate. Like, what's your opinion on that? What do you, do you I, think? That, I don't. I don't think that's good. I think that's bad. Like, that's got it. Like, do you make your hot chocolate with warm water or milk? What? What? I would definitely you? make it with milk. Okay, I so make it, it with milk myself. Yeah. So like, you're drinking frozen chocolate milk, basically. Ugh. Because Ugh. then just... you would get that layer of fat on top that happens when you freeze milk. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Blah. Blah. Um, Only a dog could love it. Yeah, I guess. But they'll eat anything. Um, so they arrive at Uncle John's cabin, uh, find it unlocked, and uh, find that Uncle John has been writing about, you know, Viking runes. And in his uh, in his notebook on the table. <laughs> yeah. So this is where the gang pieces together that something terrible has happened to Uncle John. Uh, in no small part by the fact that you know how like the trope is that the, the writing trails off the page just so that so- something bad happened to someone. Velma's uncle literally wrote, ah, as it trailed off the page. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love it when they do that in in shitty horror games or ho- shitty horror media. It's like, oh no, they're right here. Um, okay, now come and get me. Um, why would you take the time to write that out, bro? I don't know, man. It's it's just that's just how it is. Like you Did know, the he's Frank a- Welker Vi- Viking just say, "Now write down your scream, or else." <laughs> They will not know that you were kidnapped by us pretending to be ghost Vikings. Somehow that's a better accent than what he does. Uh, now, uh, now, of course, uh, at this point, they find a bunch of Viking memorabilia and the Viking be creeping. Uh, just, you know, creeping peering up. in through the window. Yeah. One of my favorite Scooby-Doo shots just by the absurdity of it. Right up there with Scooby looking in the lockers in uh, um, the Rambling Ghost episode. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, Classic shit. Like, Scoob notices the gang just doesn't believe him, of course. Because, I mean, like, why is his... Coyote. Yeah, why Why is his word, um, you know, remarkable? Uh, so then they decide to go to Norseman's Point, I believe? Yeah. Yeah, they hear a war horn in the cavern, and they go out to Nor- Norseman's Point, which is where it sounded like uh, it came from. And they see the Vikings, and Scooby and Shaggy fall into a tree, where they then get springboarded and fly like f- 500 feet out into the lake and land on the Viking longship. Yeah. And the Vikings like, who dares come aboard my Viking vessel? And... It's like you brought them aboard, asshole. You like grab them with like it's just Yeah, they land on a log that then floats towards the um the Viking thing, and then the Viking just pulls them aboard and says, Who dares board my vessel? <laughs> You're gonna fit <laughs> so many. Um they oh, man, I am having a hard time recollecting. Yeah, no, this episode's good, but the thing oh, is a good like episode. it, it this episode is very dense in terms of its shenanigans. Yeah, like, lots of stuff happens. Yeah. So they get off the ship at some point. Yeah. Uh, just through some shenanigans. Scoob does like a fancy dive. And then as they escape, the Viking laughs. But then literally like 30 seconds later, the Vikings on shore. And this sets up these Vikings powers. Yeah. They can teleport. These Vikings and can teleport straight up. This will be explained later in the episode. But the gang now goes through their usual Scooby-Doo rigmarole of trying to solve the mystery. They first go talk to the sheriff, get a clue about two geologists who might have also been victims of these Viking ghosts. The next place they go to is the Viking Museum, where they meet with the curator, who's just needlessly creepy for no reason. Got a cool Um, mustache. He does have a pretty cool mustache. Kind of (laughs) reminds me of Dick Dastardly's from the Wacky Races. Dick, Dick, Dick! Dick! And uh, this episode, at this point, it starts to develop this kind of vibe to it. Yeah. And eventually, after getting the Viking runes from Velma's uncle's journal uh, translated, they go back to Viking Lake and find, like, a secret Viking cave. Yeah. And not only are these Vikings, like, eight feet tall, yeah. they cause screen shake as they move. Yeah. These guys do, are absolute units. The man, the men are absolutely huge. Um, eventually, as they uh, as they go through this cave, they find a fucking statue, a fucking carved stone and steel statue with lit brazniers of uh, Thor. At no, least I Odin. think no of Odin, yeah. um, which the Viking then just straight up teleports in front of. In a puff of smoke. Yeah. He says, Mighty Odin, grant me power. And he teleports this Fred, Daphne, and Velma away and himself. My man's got the Bifrost on rental Monday, Wednesday, Friday. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, they don't explain that at no, all they, through the entire no. episode. They do not explain that. Uh, they no. do not explain the teleportation whatsoever. They can just do it. They just yep. do it through steam. My only, my only explanation is he's got the freaking Bifrost on rental. Uh, um, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah. there's some more shenanigans. 
Uh, there's a lot of cave stuff going on here. So yeah. Um, yeah. Fred, so, Daphne, and Velma are trapped in like some steam cave and it's up to Shag and Scoob to rescue them. Yeah, yeah. So while Shaggy and Scooby are creeping around the caves trying to rescue Fred and the girls, uh, they've run into the Vikings and they do like one of their usual like Bugs Bunny get into disguise and fuck with the monster things. Yeah. Uh, and actually at this point, they do a Swedish massage joke because of course they do. And Kasem actually does a way better Swedish accent than Welker does in this episode. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, eventually they do free Fred and the girls. And we find out that when mice are involved, Daphne has a six foot standing leap. <laughs> just, just launches herself into the air and pulls on a hidden lever to open a secret door, which then reveals this Viking. Like the, they built like this giant geological apparatus in these Viking caves to create their Viking themed uranium smuggling ring. That is that is the purpose of this. It is to smuggle uranium out of wherever the hell they are to wherever the hell they're going. So Thor, no, no, Odin is completely okay with smuggling uranium. Yeah. <laughs> Odin, like, I mean, Odin doesn't care what you're using his powers for. He just wants to be worshipped, right? Like, I mean... If, could yeah, you imagine to... Odin from the Marvel movie just like looking at like a uh, uh, Loki uh, Thor and then like one of the guys from this episode and is like Thor go defeat Sorter Loki go like become Tumblr's favorite new bad boy and you go steal uranium in a lake in Minnesota for me. <laughs> um. Uh, then we have a good minecart chase. Yeah, yeah, there's a minecart chase in this episode, and I'm a sucker for minecart chases. But the minecart chase ends with Scooby pulling a helicopter bicycle out of, <laughs> like, a bag of holding. I don't know. I Like, and I don't know either. It's that <laughs> helicopter bicycle. He pulls it out of fucking nowhere. Um, uh, uh, like... <laughs> Uh, they start flying around, just being a general just nuisance. Uh, it's 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 flipping ridiculous, man. Seriously, like this this fucking helicopter. This it's a it's a tandem bicycle helicopter. Um, they just fly it around for a while. Uh, they see that uh, Uncle John is trapped in an above ground cage. Uh, so they have to go fly the helicopter bicycle to go get him. Um, but they can only fit two people on. So Scoob has to wait on top of the thing while they take Uncle John down. And when Shaggy goes on a return run, uh, Scoob jumps on in the wrong way. So they crash helicopter down. Yeah. And at this point, we get our final chase. One of the Vikings tries to use a forklift to lift up the dumpster that Scooby and Shaggy fell in, but instead of lifting up, he drills the forklift down, which is one of the better visual gags in this whole thing. And this chase ends with the whole gang getting into a pile and Velma taking charge. Absolutely. Would you like to uh, handle this one, Pen? Would I like to handle Velma just straight up picking the entire gang off the ground and just just running? Yep. Is that this episode? Yes. Oh, that's it totally is. this episode. So Velma just straight up just picks everybody up off the ground and just go just goes, just runs. Like she goes from prone to standing with everybody in her arms, like holding them like this. Um but she just fucking booked it. Uh, now this is a this is a theme at least in these three episodes that we have seen of Velma being the swollest motherfucker. Um, Velma lifts. Velma Velma can do many many things. No, Velma absolutely lifts in this universe. Like when they time hopped from what's new, like Velma decided Fred can bench 220. I'm going to pick up the whole gang, which we calculated a conservative estimate of around 640 pounds. Absolutely. And that's, that's from prone. She's like, oh, 
I can't remember exactly what I, I'm pretty sure that's like deadlifting is lifting yeah. from prone. Yeah. So, oh my God, 600 pounds from prone to standing while running. That's, uh, I, I, I mean, the world record deadlift for a human is somewhere over t- uh, like 12 or 1500 pounds held yeah. by either Eddie Hall or half Thor Bjornsson. So yeah. not, total limits of human no, but no. velma's like five four and like velma shaped yes this She's is true. not any hall she is not a world-class bodybuilder no um so that's about it for the episode um yeah they bust the bad guys and overall have a pretty good time yeah it's a pretty good episode eight out of ten across the board i i legitimately like this episode a lot yeah. i think it's i i think it should like the Viking ghosts are pretty cool. The Bifrost thing is awesome. There's kind of a cool mystery that they set up actually decently well with the missing geologists in that it's it's a different Scooby Red Herring. Instead of being not the obvious bad guy, they look like more victims of, of whoever the real bad guy is, but actually they're the bad guys. So it's a better Red Herring than most Scooby stories. I really like this episode. I gave it an 8 out of it's, 10. It's, it's well. a great episode. Um, it's a really good episode. That bike thing is really funny. It just comes out of complete nowhere. Um, yeah, I think that that's uh, all about there is to say for it. Our next episode on to... brings the return. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. Sorry. Our next episode brings the return of Scooby dumb. Yeah. Take it away, Ben. Well, uh, Vampire Bats and Scaredy Cats uh, is the name of this one. And this is weird. This is a weird episode. Um, it's not necessarily super bad. And it's really funny because the villain is dumb. He's just really fucking dumb. It's, it's, it's great. Uh, our villain, as you could probably tell, is a vampire who is very spooky. Um, the gang is, uh, the gang is going to Daphne's friends, Lisa's birthday party, who is in off in some Island somewhere. Um, there are, are apparently vampires on this Island, according to local folklore. Um, so they actually, they get to the docks, uh, where they find random, random coffins. Yeah. Or no, no, no. The the no, captain the f- of the the ferry, yeah, uh, sends them to uh, don't open this box. And inside this box is a coffin. Of course, since they're idiots, they slip and fall. And oh no, um, coffin comes out. They accidentally slip and fall again, and they open the coffin, uh, and out comes a vampire bat. Now, this part doesn't make any fucking sense because later. Later, we learn the villain has like purchased vampire bats to to do his evil scheme. So why the fuck did he have a coffin with a vampire bat in it? There, I don't know. It was an airtight box. Fucking bat's gonna die. Yeah. So the gang gets roped into taking this coffin into the hotel. Uh, which uh, the same weekend that Lisa's holding her birthday party, there is also an undertaker's convention in this hotel. Mm, mm. Yes. The undertaker's convention. (laughs) And uh, the coffin belongs to one Mr. Drackle, an unnecessarily creepy man. Yeah, no, he's, he's just, uh, you know, cause it's Drackle, like, you know, Dracula. Yeah. Dracula. He says he says all of four lines and then just never appears later in the episode. Yeah. No, that's uh that's about how it goes. <laughs> so the gang meets up with Lisa and her uncle Leon, who's the hotel manager, and uh Lisa's supposed to inherit the hotel when she turns 18 uh and become the hotel owner. So I guess that's relevant to the episode, but Anyways, what? where where the fuck was I? Oh yeah, um, so Lisa's gonna inherit the hotel, uh, which naturally is sort of set up for the eventual villain motivation. Yeah. Uh, 
we then get a little bit of setup as um, Daphne and Velma trade rooms with Lisa because Lisa had like a big open suite and Daphne and Velma just got like a tiny room with like two twin beds in it. So Mm -hmm. they decide to trade rooms and in the very next scene, the vampire infiltrates Daphne and Velma's room shortly after Daphne and Velma say that nothing bad could happen as Velma is doing sit-ups and just getting swole. Yep. No, uh, Velma getting swole. That is quite, quite a thing. Um, the vampire shows up as they are going to sleep. Is that the right? Um, does something yep. else happen before that? I can't. No, remember. no. That The vampire shows up as they're going to sleep. The vampire shows up as they're going to sleep and uh, he uses Jaguar sound bites for yeah. some reason. Like, I, I don't know why, but he goes, oh, 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 oh. the sounds yeah. that this vampire make is just hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, there's a bunch more of shenanigans. Um, crap. It, yeah, Daphne is about to get bit and uh, they hear screaming and everybody piles in and we get a reference to a very obscure movie from 1976 called The Late Show. Yes. Um, apparently it won a bunch of awards. Yes, it was a very highly, um, it had a lot of awards for the time. Uh, yeah. I can't, it was a comedy, I believe. Yeah. It was, it was just really weird. Might be something we have to watch on our own time, but regardless, there's a brief reference to the late show after the vampire escapes from Daphne and Velma's room, uh, and Scooby Shaggy and Scooby Dumb are sent to go after it, at which point Scooby inflates himself using a bike pump, uh, to which <laughs> Velma dribbles him like a basketball and then throws him into the vent in one shot from across the room. I that that's like some Stephen Curry shit, Velma. <laughs> You're balling. And he goes right right into that vent. <laughs> so Scooby Shaggy and Scooby Dub go out into the vent, and in the meanwhile, uh, Daphne picks up the phone. And we get one of the most unintentionally funny scenes in this whole thing. I'll let you take this one, Ben. Okay, I need to... Uh, I, I Crap, I can't exactly remember what happened. I'm sorry, my memory is awful today. It's the one where it's just the shot of the vampire and the bells are ringing. And like, right. nothing. Uh, so uh, it was revealed that the proprietor of the... Um, the owner of the hotel has a wristwatch that has a work alarm on it, which is, which uh, makes a bunch of bells go off. Um, so he calls um, Daphne, uh, and there is just this one shot of him sa- of him um, right there. The bells going off. It it just so unintentionally funny. It just cracks me up every time I watch it. It just so stupid um i'm just gonna reveal the villain's plan right now he's hypnotizing his niece uh he's a creepy uncle that owns the hotel he's hypnotizing his niece to make her sign papers that say the hotel is his so we're on real estate again um and the the trigger for the hypnosis is his wristwatch going off so this entire episode is just him trying to get her to hear that. Uh, at one point he does and she get, her face goes all whack and evil and she becomes a vampire in quotation marks. Briefly. Yes, yeah, very and briefly. It's later revealed that after the phone, she like fucking reaches into a drawer, puts on some contacts and a set of fake vampire teeth to chase Scooby and Shaggy. It's... <laughs> <laughs> he's oh. basically he's the worst vampire ever he's um, so awful yeah so they uh they find the vampire in the dark room that scooby shaggy and scooby dumb enter and again we just get more inexplicable stupidity with this vampire scooby and shaggy run into a wardrobe and the vampire like prowls around opens the wardrobe does like a fucking jojo pose and then like just leaves. 
<laughs> like I, I can't I can't sugar I can't say anything else to that. That is just how it is. That's <laughs> just what happens. <laughs> But um, uh, and, it, like he doesn't actually do anything; he just he chases them. Yeah. So uh, after everybody meets up in the dark room, the creepy uncle like presents to the whole gang this like fake vampire family lore. Yeah. That he's using in this con. <laughs> Which originally I thought that this was going to be to add on to our Ebenezer Crab head cannon. But since it was well, it, at the end of the episode, it is revealed to be fake. Um, there's nothing to it. It's, it's all yeah, uh, fabrication. Yeah. yeah. So he's just more of just being the worst vampire ever. We eventually oh. get a golf cart chase with him again, just not succeeding at anything. No. Uh, as well as a hallway gag using coffin teleportation in the conference room where the uh, Undertaker's convention is going on. There's no actual undertakers. It's just a bunch of coffins. Yeah. Which, um, what? Yeah. Why are, they, why, are why, they, why are you doing that? I don't know. Uh, and uh, there was a scrap of paper, which was a clue earlier on in the episode, which had some uh, strange writing on it. That, they deduce, means that um, the creepy uncle was... Oh, there's also Lurch. We forgot about Lurch. Or is that in this episode or the next one? That's in the next episode. That's in the next one. Um, Just there's vampires, there's lurch. You know, I'm getting confused now. Um, They, the creepy uncle, bought a bunch of vampire bats from Exot. Uh, Exot. I think it's Exot. Yeah, Exo. Exo. Yes, the exotic animal store on the mainland uh, to fuck with his niece. That's why. There's yeah. no other reason. So, eventually, they find the coffin that the hypnotized Lisa is in, and Velma just slaps her awake. Uh, and they set up a trap for the vampire, where they use all the budget in one shot to animate this vampire's shadow. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I mean considering that this probably didn't have a lot of budget to begin with, like, yeah. you know, there's some episodes in this that are very obviously, uh, they did not exceed 20 yen. <laughs> they did not exceed 23 yen. So it, eventually just all the stuff that we've been talking about, about the uncle's ridiculous, terrible con is revealed. And then the episode just ends. Yep. Yeah. Like Lisa's voice actress aggressively over describes hamburgers, and yep. that's about it. <laughs> uh, I gotta, I gotta find the um the bit with the pickles and the relish. Oh yeah. God, she just she just talks. It's it's flipping hilarious. Um, uh, so we both gave that a seven out of ten. It was pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Pretty good. This episode is carried by how just unintentionally hilarious it is. Absolutely. How incompetent the villain is. And just some of the lion deliveries. It's, oh boy. It's definitely, I think, uh, among the better Scooby Dumb episodes. I think the Gator Ghoul one is still probably the best Scooby Dumb episode. Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree. Um, yeah. So that's that one. Uh, next up is Hang in There, Scooby Doo. Fun fact, uh, this episode uh, inspired uh, the best sequel James Gunn ever wrote and directed. Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. Yep. Uh, And the reason I say that was the best sequel James Gunn ever wrote and directed is because uh, in terms of uh, a sequel's quality, I firmly believe that a sequel's quality should be evaluated in terms of how does its quality compare to the first movie. When you yeah. consider classic examples of great sequels, you have Empire Strikes Back, which is a much better film than A New Hope. So it actively improved on the original Terminator, one. Terminator 2. Terminator 2 as well. Shrek That's 2. Just better. Yeah, also, Shrek 2. Yeah. Just all, all of those three movies improved 
on the original, whereas most sequels are either as good or worse. And I would say that Guardians of the Galaxy 2, while a good film on its own, is a worse movie than the original Guardians of the Galaxy. But Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed is like six times better than the first Scooby-Doo live action movie. You know, like, the, la- the last time I watched it, I realized that he was just taking the piss half of the time. It's just a parody of Scooby-Doo. Oh yeah. Like there's I, that one scene where they're in, um, they're in the forest throwing the Frisbee. And that's when I was like, this, they're just making fun of this now. This isn't even, this is, it's just a parody. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love Scooby Doo too. Unironically, I think it's a genuinely underappreciated film. It's a and pretty good movie, yeah. And considering how many movies it steals from season three of this series that we're currently reviewing, yeah. I think we should review it and cap it off with here. Because you know what, we should do that. Uh, but if we're gonna do that, we, where are we gonna review the first one? Uh, later, whenever we're talking about the one. I, I I can't say it. I scrap. I don't want to vomit on camera, so I'm just going to I'm just going to leave that. OK, um, uh, so what actually happens in uh, the pterodactyl band? Pterodactyl. Oh. oh, yes. We forgot. We're talking about the pterodactyl ghost. Yeah. <laughs> Who I'm going to spoil this for you is literally the world's most determined music pirate on the face of the planet. Dapster? Weak shit. Pterodactyl ghost? King shit. This man uh, this man drives a catering truck by day and dons a fucking pterodactyl costume by night to deliver fucking uh, rips of shit to local music stores. He's like, he's like a music pirate Batman. <laughs> but seriously, um... I, now, I just want to discuss his plan before we actually do the plot. This man has an underground system of fucking caves. He has a studio in a bunch of caves. He set up, like, caveman replica um, cave paintings and shit to throw people off of the trail that he's a music pirate. <laughs> like, that's going to take some fucking effort. This guy puts the same amount of effort into pirating music that, like, Jerma does into, like, most streams. We are both fans of Jerma, <laughs> listeners. Go watch Jerma. Please. Please go watch Jerma. He's fantastic. Anyways, this, this guy's plan is so high effort. It's it's absolutely insane. Yeah, so, so we, we should do the plot now, I think. Yeah. So the gang is going to Big Canyon Dude Ranch um, for a hang gliding competition that Fred has entered. Uh, (laughs) And they meet with the clerk, Mr. Bohannon, who is an inexplicably very French man in Arizona. Uh, And they also meet Lurch, a.k.a. Mr. Morbley, just this absolute unit of a handyman. (laughs) Hmm. Uh, he, and he's massive. Yeah. And basically, as they sort of parade around in the dark, checking into the dude ranch, uh, they encounter the pterodactyl ghost several times and realize that it's a problem. And they decide to go there. Now, folks, Mr. Bohannon's explanation of why there's a pterodactyl ghost is he says that the pterodactyls in this canyon drew cave paintings of themselves clearly they must have slowly evolved into humanoid like versions of themselves which i i am a i am a biologist by trade and i'm about to tell you no that is not how that works that is never how that works the idea of the humanoid geometry being used for all sapient creatures is uh, an inherently humanocentric and uh, basically anti-biological statement that frustrates me uh, in most um, uh, uh, genres, but I'm willing to suspend my disbelief for science fiction. However, in Scooby-Doo, which while it technically does qualify as science fiction, when they attempt to ground it in reality like that and specifically cite evolution into pterodactyl humans, 
No, I'm going to call out your bullshit on that one, Scooby-Doo. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're going to call out the writer in fucking 1977. Yeah, no, I'll invent the fucking flux capacitor. I'll put it in a DeLorean, and yeah, I'll go punch him in the face and set him straight. You, you're going to... Oh, you liar. You're going to infiltrate Warner Brothers and, like, tell them to make a Hex Girls show. Yeah, and I'll 2005. write it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'm james gunn you ever seen a picture of him no why well, could yeah. you yeah, you could replace him uh you, you know just kill james gunn and replace him become him become him <laughs> um okay What's that uh, movie where they do that oh, fuck i feel yeah. like i've seen that before but i let's... don't know i don't know um uh wow what else do we go they basically just go in these caves for like the whole episode right Yeah, and just get chased around by the pterodactyl ghost until they run into the music studio yeah they also find a receipt um that uh um like incriminates mr bohannon uh in the music pirating scheme yeah um and they, yeah, they they find a skeleton Oh shit, the fucking fucking Mr. Bones. Yeah. There's a skeleton and um he's God. just in a trench coat. Um and he's when, animate. He's animate. He's an animate skeleton. And when he hears Scooby and Shaggy say that the place is haunted, he books it. There is no explanation for this fucking skeleton. They okay. Don't explain Mr. Bones. And you know what? In that Medicine Man episode, in the uh, a bum a bum stag for Scooby, bum steer for Scooby, there is another skeleton, and they don't explain those fucking skeletons. Okay. I think that this is Crab's doing. I think that Crab is using a skeleton army to do something. I don't know what. We'll figure. We'll add it. Later. We'll add it to. We'll add it to our Excel spreadsheet of lore. Keith can go through that for us. This is this is very true. I do have a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, there's not a huge amount of shenanigans. Everything seems to have a purpose. They're moving towards something. Um, yeah, but a lot of this episode is made up by chases with the pterodactyl ghost, which, depending on your a view of Scooby Doo, is. Do you want a lot of the monster and little mystery solving or a lot of mystery solving and a little monster? It's hard to know. But yeah, it basically, this whole thing wraps up as being a very high effort 1977 version of Napster that ends in a raft hang glider uh, companion chase with the pterodactyl ghost where they eventually get the pterodactyl ghost and Mr. Bohannon in custody and they explain the whole thing. And there's a rational explanation for the whole thing in that the pterodactyl ghost was so that they could ferry the records across the canyon without drawing suspicion to the fact that they were hang gliding across the canyon. Yeah. It, 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 I, and it's good. Like, this isn't the best episode. I'd argue it's worse than the last two we saw, even yeah. though it's got a far more iconic monster than either of the last two, um, <laughs> especially thanks to James Gunn. Damn it, James Gunn, you you beautiful bastard. Um, and the villain scheme is uniquely memorable. And it's interesting, though, because in Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed, James Gunn threw it out in, instead uh, casting the pterodactyl ghost's uh, person as being a mad scientist trying to create genetic experiments. Yeah. And I, and I wonder if he did that because Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed came out the same year as I th it either came out the same year or shortly before or had the same uh, production as the Italian job because Seth Green is in both of those movies. I miss and, Seth Green. Um, the thing about the Italian job remake with Mark Wahlberg is that movie has a lot of references to Napster specifically. Like it, <laughs> it matters a lot to the plot. So <laughs> With with the pterodactyl ghost's original plot being Napster <laughs> and that being like a huge thing now, it's like I wonder if James Gunn changed it just so that he was like 
trying not to like co- follow in the Italian job's footsteps oh my like God. he was being too trendy. Cause this, this guy's villain plot is literally Napster and Scooby-Doo two came out when Napster was a fucking thing. I don't know. It's just something I just thought of right now, but I find it interesting. <laughs> and I've broken my co-host, everybody. That, that just sounds like an insane conspiracy theory. <laughs> You're coming over to me with the Pepe Sylvia. I got boxes full of Pepe. I got boxes, boxes full of Seth Green. Boxes. The Seth Green cinematic universe. Where does <laughs> where does uh, where does um, Robot Chicken fit into this? Uh, probably somewhere next to the Austin Powers franchise, where he plays Scott Evil. Oh God, shit! Wait, are the Scooby Doo segments in Robot Chicken canon? Do we have to watch those? Oh God, we we might. Oh God! <laughs> Technically, it's not official material, but it's still funny. Whatever. Yeah. Maybe April Fool's next year or something. Um, okay. Thank you, Seth Green. Thank you, Seth Green. Um, so uh, we gave that one a six out of ten. That's about that. Uh, it's got a good sound bite. That was our gag. The, yeah, the, the pterodactyl, pterodactyl sound bite. Pterodactyl Ghost has a really good sound bite. One of my favorite unique monster sound bites, I would say. Oh, yeah. Right up absolutely. there with the Gator Ghoul sound bite. And Jaguaro soundbite. Weird coming out of a vampire, but amazing coming out of my man Jaguaro. We'll get there. I, I really hope that Jaguaro... We've been hyping up fucking Jaguaro for the entirety of this season. And I do, it would just... It would, I, you know, I would be so deflated if the Jaguaro episode sucks. I mean, I don't know, but season three is going to be whack. There's just so much stuff in it. Old Iron Face, Skeleton Men, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, once again, more stuff in uh, James Gunn's Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. God damn it. 10,000 Volt Ghost was in Monsters Unleashed. He was just as fucking OP in that, too. That is true. He, Voltner is a petty bastard, and he does not care for anything. He yes. will melt us all. Uh, <laughs> by the way, Voltner... Sorry, viewers, but... Voltner is still our um, our preferred uh, candidate. He's probably going to win it. Like, yeah. he's a walking nuclear dynamo. I know we've made this observation before, but this is the yeah. truth. <laughs> so now that this has devolved into Seth Green's centered chaos, uh, how about we decide to wrap this up here, Pat? Okay, cool. Scorecard. Um, well, folks... Not much actually changed because there wasn't really any petty crime or uh, anything. There's just one more introduction to Scooby Dumb, bringing our total to three, three Scooby Dumbs. Um, if you enjoy our podcast and would like to contact us, you can follow us on Twitter at do underscore review or email us at the Scooby Doo Review at gmail.com. And that's the episode, everybody. Thanks for listening. And remember, we wouldn't have a podcast without those meddling kids and their dumb dog. Bye-bye.